this is an example of how to apply Gauss's law to an infinite line of charge. Um, and let me remind you that in real life there is no such thing as an infinite line of charge. However, there are plenty of times where um, a line of charge is very large compared to a region in which we are interested in dis determining the electric field. And so this may seem on the, uh, <clears throat> on the face of it like it's not very useful for real world uh, problems. But it actually turns out to be fairly useful because you can imagine that if uh, your infinite line of charge or your, your non-infinite line of charge is something like uh, an insulated wire that's carrying, uh, that's been charged and you're a small ant on that wire, to you that looks pretty infinite, right? And so this is actually a pretty useful calculation as well as being instructive on how to use Gauss's law. So <clears throat> the first thing to do is to convince ourselves that the E field is constant in direction for um, for equal distances from the wire. So let me just <clears throat> give a, a small segment of charge here which is going to have an electric field for us from this one segment that looks somewhat like this. Of course the field is going to extend out radially in all directions right? Uh, but of course right next to that charge is another charge for which you can make the same argument. The field will extend, that's a terrible arrow the field will extend radially in all directions. Please notice that any component of any of those field lines that is in the horizontal direction will have a partner somewhere along the line which will exactly cancel it. I have not drawn it very well but you can see it here. These two guys, <coughs> their x components will cancel if x is, is uh, the horizontal direction. The horizontal components should cancel. Now this is an infinite line of charge. There will be canceling pairs everywhere and I should point out that um, this field I've only drawn it on top but of course I can draw it on bottom as well but it makes no difference all horizontal components will cancel in pairs and I'm only left let me get rid of all that stuff I'm only going to be left with an E field which is radially directed of course I've only drawn in two vectors uh, <clears throat> but there are others if I can do this in two dimensions nah that's just going to uh, it will be radially directed everywhere. So it's extending out from this segment in all radial directions. Therefore, <clears throat> if I construct a Gaussian surface like I have done, I've constructed a Gaussian cylinder of radius r and length l. If I construct that cylinder, my E field uh, inside that will be perpen... Nah, that's not what I meant to do. <clears throat> will be perpendicular everywhere to the surface of that cylinder. There are no components that pass through the ends of the cylinder. If this is a can, this would be the end of the can, and uh, this is the label, right? That's what my teachers always said. There are no components that pass through the ends of this can. They only pass through the label, and they pass through perpendicularly. And as long as we center our Gaussian sphere on this line of charge, uh, all points on the surface are equidistant from the line, which means that the E field is constant in magnitude, and it also means that E dot dA... Uh, everywhere boils down to just EA. <clears throat> For this line of charge, let me point out we are given a linear charge density, which I've indicated over here with a lambda. Uh, if you watch the previous example on uh, charged spherical insulators, we determined the charge density. It's not possible to do that here because we have an infinite line of charge. However, if you're given the charge density, or you can empirically determine it if you're in the laboratory, uh, that's available to you, and we're going to use that so I'm just going to form Gauss's law here. I'm going to I'm going to write the integral of e dot dA. Remember, let me draw in what a is here. Let me go to a different color for a. How about yellow? A is my area vector, which is normal to the surface of this cylinder, and of course that extends around radially. That comes from every point, every differential area element. Uh, the orange is my E field, the A is the yellow, and Gauss's law just says that this is equal to Q enclosed over epsilon naught, right? Uh, same process as I've been doing. The E field is constant because we're equidistant from the line of charge. E comes outside of the integral, which leaves us with the integral of dA, which for a cylinder, uh, rem let me remind you, the area of a cylinder is 2 pi r 
times L, that's the area of the label, plus 2 pi r squared. This contribution comes from the ends. This contribution comes from what I'm calling the label. But we've already said that our contribution to the flux from the ends is zero. So this actually, from the formula of a cylinder, gets us nothing. Let me just get rid of it. So the, really, the only area that we're concerned about is the area of the label. So I'll just erase this cylinder subscript. It's just the area of the label because that is the only surface through which the electric field passes. Uh, that there's no flux through the ends of the cylinder. <clears throat> so my dA just becomes 2 pi RL, right? So actually, let me get rid of all of that. And let me rewrite Gauss's law down here. E, because that's outside the integral, it's constant, uh, at least it's constant at that distance in magnitude. A times 2 pi RL is equal to Q enclosed. Well, what's Q enclosed? Q enclosed is the linear charge density, lambda, times whatever length we're looking at. And the length we're looking at is the length uh, encompassed by my Gaussian cylinder, which is just L. So Q enclosed, let me write that up here, Q enclosed is equal to lambda, uh, I'm right over here, is equal to lambda times L. That's the Q that's been enclosed by my cylinder. So that's equal to lambda L over epsilon naught. Uh, you can see some mathematical magic happens here. My L's are going to cancel. And what I'm, if I divide through by the 2 pi r, what that leaves me with is that the E field is equal to 2 pi... Ah, sorry. That's not correct. Lambda over 2 pi r epsilon naught. Now let me go to a new sheet and show you the form that most people put this in. I've got the E of an, of an infinite line of charge is equal to lambda over 2 pi r uh, epsilon naught, right? Well, if I multiply this by a very clever one, that is to say 2 over 2, uh, well that gets me 4 pi epsilon naught in the denominator, which we have already defined as, Q, as k, the Coulomb constant. So that means I have uh, 2 lambda, and that's a k here, because I'm going to pull out the 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, over r. So this is kind of interesting, over r. Normally we see fields decreasing as 1 over r squared, or increasing as 1 over r squared, depending on which direction you're going. Uh, but in, in general, uh, f uh, forces or fields that are associated with forces fall off as 1 over r squared, but because of the geometry, because of this infinite line of charge, it actually only falls off as 1 over r. So it is a, it's, a, um, it's a different animal than what we saw from a point charge in spherical coordinates.